So um, I took this assignment very seriously uh, when it came through. I hadn't thought about literary history in a long time. I mean, just in a general way. And I really tried to go back and look at how people have looked at literary history and what some of the problems are in a broader way. In 1969, at the height of the theory boom, the University of Virginia inaugurated a prestigious new journal called New Literary History. Its editor, Ralph Cohen, it still exists, the journal. It's now edited by Rita Felsky and somebody, somebody else. Um, its editor, Ralph Cohen, featured an advisory board heavy on European theory, including such names as Hans Georg Gadamer from Heidelberg, Robert Weimann from Humboldt, and the only woman on the board, Vida Markovic from Belgrade. The journal's mission statement reads as follows. That was, this was the cover of the first issue, Context, Dialectic, Phenomenology, so on. All right, and the mission statement is here. New Literary History, a journey, journal of theory and interpretation, welcomes three types of contributions. Articles on theory of literature that deal with such subjects as the reasons for literary change, the definitions of periods and their uses in interpretation, the evolution of styles, conventions, genres, and their relationship to each other, and to the periods in which they flourish, the interconnection between national literary histories, the place of evaluation in literary history, etc. Articles from other disciplines that help interpret or define the problems of literary history, and articles on the rationale of literary history in the college and university. Now, notice those italics, which are Cohen's, not mine. They're revealing. He's at pains to undermine claims for literary autonomy. Literature, he suggests, must be studied in conjunction with related disciplines. There's always that fear that literature is not enough. That has bedeviled us for decades and will probably continue to, and that you have to bring in something else, whether it's neuroscience, whether it's this, whether it's that, but heaven forbid, you can't really just have a history of literature. Now notice that such claims are not made for, by military historians or economic historians, and they imply right away that the term literary has no clear-cut boundaries. Nevertheless, by insisting on self-consciousness, on theoretical approaches to literary history, Cohen clearly hopes to distinguish his journal from the then dominant scholarly journals like Philological Quarterly, Modern Language Review, the old-fashioned journals that took the idea of historical change for granted and engaged primarily in textual, interpretive, and source and influence studies. More important, although Cohen doesn't say this, the aim of the new journal was to distinguish new literary history, and that was the real subtext, from the then reigning new criticism, which was increasingly being perceived as avowedly formal and ahistorical, the irony being that such key new critical texts as Cleon Brooks's Modern Poetry and the Tradition were at pains to define the differences between modernism and its romantic antecedents. A famous essay like W.K. Wimsett's on romantic nature imagery carefully differentiated Coleridge's treatment of sensation from the imagery of poets like William Bowles, whose aesthetic, the critic claimed, was still firmly grounded in 18th century habits of association. But literary history, in any case, was conceived from the first issue on as a problematic, not a method. A problematic, not a method. Since, as the mission statement made clear, the literary and literary history could not be isolated from the larger history, political, economic, cultural, of which it was clearly a part, NLH quickly turned into a theory journal, not appreciably different from such counterparts as critical inquiry and representations. It featured discussions of semiotics, linguistics, cognitive poetics, phenomenology, and reader response theory, very big then, and there were issues on Heideggerian and Wittgensteinian critical applications. Cohen, himself an 18th century scholar whose interest was in generic change, tried to store up the focus on history, declaring in his editorial for the 10th anniversary issue, 1979, that literary criticism, literary history, and even literary theory are all literary genres, and as such they are historical. That is, they arise as journals do at particular moments in time, and they have particular ends that time erodes. Of course, all these genres have their own modes of proceeding, but all are historically determined. Thus, any genre with O, drama, literary criticism, or literary theory is historical, said Cohen. But if literary theory is itself historical, 
The question remains whether it's possible to write a satisfying literary history of a particular period or movement. And we've been talking about that a lot at this conference. Hayden White's widely celebrated meta-history, which came out in 1973, cast further doubt, a doubt frequently expressed by post-structuralist critics, on the literary historian's ability to provide a causal or even sequential account of literary events. At the same time, and this is the paradox that animates a conference like ours, academic study of English or French or comparative literature continues, the text of this this morning, to be largely period-driven. Job candidates define themselves as medievalists, Renaissance specialists, postmodernists, postcolonialists, while with the new burgeoning ethnic and race studies, queer studies, and echo criticism having their primary focus on the contemporary. Um, our own conference has defined its area, right, as European modernism, 1900, 1950. And in keeping with these divisions and specializations, the major university presses in the UK and the US continue to publish large and prominent histories of literature. Volumes produced by leading scholars designed to provide the basic knowledge needed to master a given literary field. <clears throat> now consider the most recent histories of English literature from Oxford and Cambridge. In 2004, the Oxford English Literary History under the general editorship of Jonathan Bate produced as the last part of its chronological survey four volumes on the 20th century. Four, they only have nine, but everything else, it's a lot. Volume 10, 1910, 1940, called The Modern Movement by Chris Baldick. 11, 1930 to 70, Literature Among the Wars by Rick Rylance. 12, 1960, 2000, The Last England, question mark, by Randall Stevenson. And 13, 1948 to 2000, The Internationalization of English Literature by Bruce King. Now, now that wears all the previous centuries together, took up nine volumes, the 20th gets four, comprising roughly 2,000 pages. Chapter divisions are largely based on genre. In volume 10, The Modern Movement, which is of the greatest interest for us here at History Modernism, each chapter begins with an italicized list of words. <laughs> uh, new words. The Modern Poetry chapter has its, its tag, I put it up here for you, Audenesque, Counter-Rhythm, Emote, Hypersensitivity, Imagism, Off-Rhyme, Power-Rhyme, Pasticheur, Plangently, and Yatesian. Now, such a list might make readers suppose that off-rhyme is a sign of hypersensitivity, I don't know, mm -hmm. or that Auden was a pasticheur, since they're all there together. But in fact, the chapter is a good, solid, and very learned survey of English poetry from Hardy and Yeats to the 1930s. And in general, the generic and occasionally thematic chapters, there's a chapter on the Great War, there's a chapter on sex and sexualities, are very useful for looking up trends, movements, names, dates, and associations and each has a full bibliography. The main innovation of the sequence is Bruce King's final volume, devoted entirely to first or second generation immigrant writers, who are writers of color, with chapters on topics such as West Indian social realists, black modernists, drama, black, black feminist, and Asian breath, and so on. The coverage here is very conscientious. I looked at, for example, the pages on the Scottish black lesbian poet, Jackie Kay, who I've read, and was impressed by King's close reading of specific poems. At the same time, in giving the writers of color a separate volume, the history ignores the relationships between, say, Jackie Kay and Denise Riley, or for that matter, with the great white working class male poet, Tom Rayworth, who is barely mentioned in this history, who for me is one of the important people in the period. All the volumes are written, writes Jonathan Bain in his general editor's preface, in the belief that literary history is a discipline necessary for the revelation of the power of imaginative writing to serve as a means of human understanding past, present, and future. It's difficult to quarrel with such a statement, but it's equally difficult to get excited about it or to look for revisionary judgments. Indeed, the Oxford English Literary History is best understood as a useful reference book rather than a full-blown history. It's, it's, a, it's like a reference book that you have on your desk. You can look up names but it's not something that's going to give you any new view, I think, of the period. Its counterpart, the Cambridge History of 20th Century English Literature, edited by Laura Marcus and Peter Nichols, is a more sophisticated, self-conscious attempt to cover the same ground and in roughly half the space and in a single volume. Unlike the Oxford Literary History, which assigns each volume its own author, the Cambridge counterpart is an edited book with a set of 45 expert contributors, including Michael Norrick, 
who is here with us today, um, and other really well, the, the top people. In the introduction, Marcus and Nichols admit that theirs has been a difficult brief, their volume covering as it does, quote, a period in which questions of history and nation are particularly volatile. They are especially concerned with the troubled relation of internationalist perspectives to nationalist ones. British modernism, they posit, was an exilic phenomenon, hardly English at all, and at its height mounted a radical attack on British society and government in their most settled and conservative forms. England and Englishness were criticized from the outside as avant-gardeism was increasingly equated with cosmopolitanism. After the high modernist phase of the 20s, we find an increasing attraction to forms of localism and regionalism. Now notice here that the nationalist focus is understood as something of a roadblock. The modernism of the first part of the century was, the editors admit, exilic and cosmopolitan. Its leading practitioners, as they imply, were not English at all. W.B. Yeats, Joyce, Beckett were Irish, James, Eliot, Pound, American, Joseph Conrad was Pole, Ford, Maddox, Ford was German. I mean, this is Harvey News, this is always said, but it is always good to remember that. That is a very important fact. Again, the various avant gardes, futurism, both its Italian and Russian, various expressionism, cubism, Dada, and surrealism were continental imports. Gertrude Stein, surely one of the key modernists writing in English, but living in Paris, played a key part in the generic and stylistic transformations of writing in the 20th century, but she can't be counted as English, so she's barely mentioned in the Cambridge history, whereas Eliot, who lived in England from his 26th year on, but we tend to claim him as an American, we can get into all that, but it always is amazing to me that, you know, here he appears as an Englishman, is counted. Now, in their effort not to overrate either individual writers that's considered old-fashioned, like Joyce or Virginia Woolf, or to give continental art movements too much attention, and in their evident conviction that a literary history like theirs must give the second half of the century equal time, the editors have produced a somewhat pallid picture, I think, of 20th century English literature. You have chapters with titles like Trauma and War Memory, The Time Mind of the Twenties, Psychoanalysis and Literature, Speed, Violence, Women, America, or The Thirties, Politics, Authority, Perspective. They provide coverage of a wide variety of interesting writings, whether biography, memoir, social treatise, or the new fiction. But what is somehow missing, to me in this book, is a sense of urgency. The urgency the political historians tend to have much more and have recently brought to the table in a series of careful and controversial millennial studies of World War I. This, of course, this last year, there have been dozens of studies and many of them are very good. And you never find those historians sort of apologizing or thinking there isn't really something to talk about or feeling they have to present it in a certain way. The first half of the 20th century, 1914 to 45, now often and I think justly regarded as one long war, witnessed some of the worst carnage, brutality, and violence in the history of the West. The First World War, as devastating as it was unforeseen, brought on a rupture and transvaluation from which we have never recovered. It was, after all, trauma and war memory, to take the heading of chapter 10 in the Cambridge, that created the ethos of the English 30s, whose politics authority perspective is covered by Rod Mangum in chapter 20. Now, the problem is exacerbated in the 20 chapters, the first half is 24, devoted to the second half of the century. Modernism, i put this on for you because I think it's an interesting quote. Modernism, the editors say in their introduction, must be seen as not simply a movement belonging to the early decades of the century, but as a tendency that lives a rich and discontinuous life across the period as a whole. The notion of the postmodern, in apparent violation of its own terms, has not proven to be an efficient periodizing concept that clearly situates us in a context distinct from modernity. Rather, it affirms a continuing and troubled relationship to a modernity that we cannot evade. And I thought that was very interesting, touche. From the 1970s to the 1990s, in such signature works as François Lyotard's La Condition Postmoderne and Jameson's Postmodernism and the Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism, 1992, lines between modernism and postmodernism were firmly drawn. I myself used the latter term regularly in those years. I never used that term anymore for all kinds of reasons, but we used it. Um, 
In the 60s and 70s, modernism was rejected or at least criticized for its elitism, its imperialism, colonialism, racism, and sexism, and to differentiate between modernist individualism and postmodernist populism between high and low was de rigueur. But by the turn of the century, much of what had seemed so new in the black British theater and the post-colonial Indian novel began to reveal itself as, after all, still curiously enough in the modernist order that the difference were nearly as great as Ihab Hassan used to do with those charts he made where he compared the city to the global village and, and uh, you know, you had all these point-by-point -point comparisons. Having defined postmodernism vis-a-vis late capitalism, Jameson returned in his 2007 book, The Modernist Papers, to a revaluation of the modernist classics from Baudelaire, Rambo, and Mallarmé to Thomas Mann's Magic Mountain, Kafka's Metamorphoses, and Proust's Anna Gachesse de Tom Perdu to the writings of Gertrude Stein. Of the latter, Jameson suggests that questions of syntax and parts of speech can be seen as revelatory of those deeper structures of literary history that he's at pains to examine. A history which the allegedly apolitical Gertrude Stein, he says, will ultimately link to imperialism itself as well as to American exceptionalism. Now, Jameson's modernism, we should know, is primarily a continental affair, European affair. He doesn't even make that point. That's what it is. It thus flies in the face of those young and literary scholars who have in recent years made a strong case for replacing the European, much less the nationalist, English or American model with a globalist one. I'm thinking of critics like Emily Apter, Y. Chi Dimmock, Douglas Mell, Rebecca Walkowitz. The term planetarity, first used by Gayatri Spivak, has become a popular phrase. At this writing, Columbia University Press is just about to publish coming out any day, Susan Stanford Friedman's book, Planetary Modernisms, which according to the blurb, moves from large-scale instances of pre-1500 modernities, such as Tang Dynasty China and the Mongol Empire, to small-scale instances of modernisms, including the poetry of Du Fu and Kabir and Abbasid ceramic art. She maps the interconnected modernisms of the long 20th century, pairing Joseph Conrad with Tayyip Sali, E.M. Forster with Arundhati Roy, Virginia Woolf with the Tagores, and M.A. Cizé with Theresa Hakum Cha. She reads post-colonial works from Sudan and India and engages with the idea of negritude. Rejecting the modernist concepts of marginality, othering, and major minor, Friedman instead favors rupture, mobility, speed, networks, and diversions, elevating the agencies and creative capacities of all cultures, not only in the past and present, but also in the century to come. Now that's a tall order. That's all part of the blurb. I just read you. <laughs> Modernity, we now learn, and Friedman gave us a foretaste of the book in a 2010 essay, which is in Modernism Modernity, the journal Modernism Modernity, so you can read that, is infinitely expandable. Yoruba, Bengali, Chinese, Arabic, modernity is to be found anywhere, anytime. Friedman knows well enough that hers is intentionally an extremist move, but as in the case of new literary history, her real charge is negative. Always watch for that. I mean, often when people have this kind of manifesto, it's really what they're attacking, not so much what they're promoting. She wants to overturn the perceived status quo that is, quote, to break the mold of Eurocentrism. In her words, Eurocentrism is the dominant centrism to confront because the West's narrative of itself is the story of its own invention of modernity and because the field of modernist studies itself began in the West as a study of Western modernities and modernisms. A planetary modernist studies begins with provincializing Europe, provincializing Europe, she says, to invoke Dipesh Chakrabarty's resonant phrase. And the reference there is to a study called Provincializing Europe, Postcolonial Thought and Historical Difference 2000, year 2000, whose Bengali author Dipesh Chakrabarty argues that European political and cultural theorizing are largely irrelevant to the pressing social and political problems of a developing nation like Bangladesh. This may be the case, but note that it is not an historical case. For to talk about modernism, whether our interest is in genres like manifesto and collage, its revisionary treatment of character, or its need to respond to a new industrial mass culture without including Europe, it's like wanting to be an ornithologist without 
without including birds. At least I think so. I mean, it just to me is completely ridiculous. Modernism, the very word, the very term, is a European invention. That's where it came from. So to say, well, we're just going to skip Europe because that's Eurocentric, really doesn't really make any sense, no matter what your perspective, I think, would actually be. The new globalism, with its wishful thinking that every culture, hither and yon, yields texts usefully called modernist, so that to take Friedman's example, the great French Montenegan poet, M. S. Césaire, the explosively Baroque French poem, Cahier d'un retour au pays natal, can be profitably read against the poetic prose of Dictée, written half a century later in English, with short French passages and Korean photographs by the young South Korean American poet, Teresa Ha Kong Cha, simply because both the writing as outsiders seems rather, you know, pushing things. I mean, you can generalize to the extent that things don't mean anything then anymore. Such comparisons struck me as largely frivolous, for not only is the language problem totally evaded, and new globalists argue that it doesn't matter that we give read given works in translation, a notion questionable even for the novel, perhaps not as much so, but certainly for poetry, but it also places the English language and only the English language at the center of the universe in a mode that certainly could be considered imperialist. When, for example, Susan Stanford Friedman praises initiatives like Virginia Gagné's Global Circulation Project, a vast online dialogue among scholars around the world on the circulation of different Anglophone modernisms, Friedman takes for granted that such one-way traffic is satisfactory, that what should be circulating is our modernism. And, and here, it's mostly French modernism, I've noticed, are the examples. I mean, honestly, everybody uses their own examples. But you have to be careful to think those examples are then the only examples. And of course, in the Cambridge history and the Oxford history, since those are done by Anglo-Americans on Anglo-English literature, however much they want to branch out, they're looking at it very much from that point of view. And indeed, as Mao and Wolkowitz um, make clear in, their, in a synoptic essay for PMLA, called the New Modernist Studies, globalism for Anglophone critics usually refers to the reception, adaptation, and transformation of English and American modernist works in the developing world. The assumption is that ours are the primary works, and hence the new globalism is that which recontextualizes them. Now more broadly it has been argued, notably by David Damrosch, who's at Harvard, the comparative is probably the chair of comparative literature, that comparative literature deals precisely with the, with the way classics from all over the world, he begins with the Book of Gilgamesh, which he has translated, travel in translation and adapt to their local circumstances. That thus the problem of the language origin can be subverted. Translation, far from being a limitation, he argues, is thus the condition for meaningful response. Now that argument may do very well when we talk of the ancient world, or even of Don Quixote, but I think it falls short when we take up the very particular ethos of the 20th century, between 1900 and 1950, a moment in literary history when language came to the forefront as itself a key object of study. So it's hard to say that we'll sort of ignore that. Now, but suppose that we adopt a more pragmatic perspective. Going beyond the nationalist perspective of the Cambridge and Oxford histories need not mean a rush to globalism. More useful, it would seem, is to place English or American modernism as part of the larger Europe of which it was and remains, I would say, a part. Modernism, that is to say, begins at home, where home is the larger Europe, Eastern as well as Western, we associate with those momentous historical events of the early century. Rapid fire, I mean, I don't need to go over them for you, it's the most well-known thing. Rapid fire, industrialization, urbanization, World War I, and in the midst of war, the October Revolution of 1917. It was in Europe, after all, that the very term modernism was conceived. Now why then are the European connections to Anglophone literature, connections currently so sworn, so undermined by the current outcry against Eurocentrism? Why is it unfashionable to concern oneself with, say, Belgian poetry or Czech fiction? Here, Ralph Cohen's notion of historicizing theory may be helpful. We might recall for starters that students of comparative literature, I'm, I'm talking now about the United States especially, in the 50s and 60s came on the scene during an ardent period of Francophilia. France was regarded in the US, and I remember this well, since it's up to all of the 50s and 60s, France was regarded as the site of resistance. It was only much later that we learned of the extent of collaboration in 
and that is true, but, but it was regarded as the site of resistance, the great good place was France. Everybody wanted to go to France. French art and literature, and especially French theory, in those days primarily phenomenology, became the model. And to study, say, Yeats and Eliot was to study via Arthur Simmons, groundbreaking the symbolist movement in literature, 1899, Baudelaire and Verlaine, Malamé, Lafargue, as well as Huisman's, Abbe Bourg, and so on. The Bollingen series at Princeton published the complete works of Paul Valéry. Certain modernists of the 60s, certainly modernists of the 60s, even Susan Stanford Friedman takes her examples from Picasso and Marie Cassat, pay homage to the French connections. Susan Stanford Friedman, who doesn't mention a single other European country or any author of anything other, but France, she pays at least a slight amount of lip service because she grew up at a time, I mentioned, where you know France is something you did have to know something about. Now, the case of the Axis nations and of the Soviet Union was quite different. When in 1986 I published The Futurist Moment, readers expressed surprise at the foregrounding of the proto-fascist Marinetti, even though the period I dealt with the early 1910s actually preceded the birth of fascism, and even though two of the greatest futurists, Pochoni and San Elia, were killed in the Great War, probably the two greatest ones. The Cabaret Voltaire I had wanted to show had adopted many of the technical features of Italian futurism, from the Manifesto and Parole di Libertà to Marinetti's destruction of syntax to the preference for cabaret performance um, art of a conventional theater. But because of its bad politics, and it certainly had very bad politics, a cloud still hangs over Italian futurism. No such cloud hangs over the Russian avant-garde, directly associated as it was with left politics, here neglect, at least until after 1989, with the demise of the Soviet Empire, had practical causes. Materials were not available, translations few and hard to come by, and it has taken more than two decades of archival study for the Russian avant-garde of the war years to become an integral part of modernism. That's still true, and it's by the way especially true for art historians. The great art historians, Rosalind Krauss, Ivan Lenoir, T.J. Clark, who does have a chapter in his wonderful book, on, on the Russians, but very rare, because they didn't learn Russian. Russian wasn't part of their background, and so they're not going to deal with this art, although they're the first to say that Mayevich, Elisitsky, that these were perhaps the greatest artists of the century. But times are changing that way in a very positive way. Right now, there's available the two-volume Casimir Mayevich letters, documents, essays, and criticism, published by the Tate Gallery in London last year in English, and that is a monument if you barely can pick it up, it's two volumes. But if you want to know how theory developed, how the theory behind the Russian avant-garde, which is so crucial, which goes all the way back, is it, you have it all in Malievich's own memoirs, letters, the manifestos, and so on. And this has never really been available before. So we can certainly reconfigure modernism that way. It deals with the burning questions of modernism, representability, language formation, identity, the relation of art to politics are discussed at every turn. Indeed, and this is my thesis, I guess, far from being too Eurocentric, the study of European modernism is still in its infancy. And here a reconsideration of Germanophone writing, I think, is in order. Now I say that partly, I'm biased because I'm Viennese, it's my birthplace and it's what I've just been writing on, it's my new book, but I really do believe this, so I'll throw it out. In the 1950s, German literature, art, and culture were not popular in the UK and the US. It was too soon after the war, and the Holocaust to cast a kind eye even on the German classics. But throughout the war years, prominent writers like Thomas Mann and Brecht, both of them exiled in Los Angeles, were read and studied. And by the 70s, as Marxist theory began to flourish in both the UK and the US, the Frankfurt School and Weimar Republic became prominent. With the publication of Benjamin's Illuminations in the Harry Zone translation with an introduction by Hannah Arendt, and that was as early as 1969. When I look back at that, I'm surprised. I thought that came later. But that was in 69. That's the same year New Literary History began, by the way. The work of art in the age of reproduction, now more properly translated as the work of art in the age of reproducibility, became a touchstone for the understanding of modernism everywhere. The essays on Proust and Kafka, the thesis of history, and the task of the translator followed. Benjamin had been a victim of the Nazis, and so his understanding of the aporias of the 20th century became central to the study of modernism. 
Before long, first Benjamin, then Adorno, and indeed the larger Weimar model became, ironically enough, the paradigm for study of Anglo-Americanism. I say ironically because Adorno, a refugee from Hitler who lived in the U.S. for 12 years, 37 to 49, never expressed the slightest interest in Anglo-American literature. Indeed, the U.S. provided him primarily with the example of the scorned culture industries, as well as the jazz he certainly he wholly disliked, and John Cage, and so on. America, a terrible place, couldn't wait to get back to Frankfurt. <coughs> Nevertheless, U.S. intellectuals turned increasingly to the Frankfurt School and its particular Marxist paradigm. In 1997, the University of California Press published the Weimar Republic Sourcebook, big fat book, an encyclopedic volume that introduces non-German speaking readers to the great political, sociological, psychological, philosophical, and literary writings, both from the left and the right, produced in the brief interregnum 1918-32, which was Weimar. Few literary critics and historians have complained that the application of Weimar theory coupled with an ignorance of German literature itself, to Anglo-American literature might be problematic. But from an historical perspective, the current equation of Weimar with advanced literary and intellectual thought in the early decades of the century has curiously obscured the site where, after all, World War I began, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Perhaps because post-World War II Austria has become such a small, shrunken state even as nations like Hungary and Czechoslovakia, once part of the empire, were struggling to create their own identity, Austro-modernism has been treated, one and all, as no more than a footnote to German literature. As such, it has been readily dismissible by globalists, eager to relate the part of Europe with which they're familiar, Anglo-America, the United Kingdom, to African, Near Eastern, or East Asian cultures to make that jump. Certainly post-colonial culture has become central in our own time, but if you're going to be historical, that was not true in the early 20th century, certainly not to the same degree. And it's amazing to leave out that whole huge European part, I would say Russia, too. So my example is going to be that Habsburg connection. So let's take a map, the following map of before and after. Here before 1914, you have the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Now, of course, you know this better than Americans do. If you show this map in Americans, news to most people don't even know there was an Austro-Hungarian Empire. I've tried it out on students and even colleagues, and they said, there was an Austro-Hungarian Empire. Where was that? Going to just a war with Germany. So you don't need to know all that, because I'm sure you do. But do it anyway. Uh, before 1914, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was a multi-ethnic and polyglot entity covering 24,000 square miles that you have in this figure, a big thing. It's 50 million inhabitants, including what are now Hungarians, Czechs, Slovenes, Serbs, Croats, Bosnians and Romanians, as well as the Poles of Galicia, the Russians of the western Ukraine, and the Italians of the southern Tyrol and Trieste. Four years later, and here are the different entities, these are the different entities themselves. Four years later, um, when World War I ended and the dual monarchy was dissolved, Vienna became the capital of a small and fragile republic that had only six million inhabitants and a territory of 32,000 miles, a nation the shape of a tadpole. Here it finally is, you know, a little Austria, you can see it there, it's so small, it's practically hard to see, right? Whose eastern head, Vienna, sat uneasily on a body whose tail was in the Fahagelberg, close to Switzerland mountains. Back a minute to that. There it is, close to Switzerland. Um, indeed, the first republic, born in 1918, was made up of the area that remained after the bulk of the empire was parceled out by Woodrow Wilson, mostly to create new nations or to add to the existing ones. And then we get a new map of Europe. As the French Prime Minister, George Clemenceau, remarked, l'Autriche, c'est ce qui reste. <laughs> Austria is what remains. From the high side of the century, Hitler's annexation in 1938 of Austria, the vague, gray, and inert shadow, as Stefan Zweig called it, of the former imperial monarchy, was probably inevitable, as was the coming of the Second World War just 20 years after the end of the first. Increasingly, historians are referring to the events of 1914 to 45 as the Long War or the Second Thirty Year War. In 1918, most Austrians, including the Jews, 
had wanted to become a part of Greater Germany, but Woodrow Wilson and his colleagues were convinced that Anschluss would make Germany too powerful, and so it was prohibited by the Treaty of Saint-Germain and, and Versailles. When it finally took place 20 years later, Anschluss occurred not by treaty, but by Nazi force. Now, in Anglophone critical dis discourse, Austria, when it's talked about at all, is more or less synonymous with Vienna. From Karl Shorsky's Fantasy Echo Vienna and Alan Yannick's Wittgenstein's Vienna, both published in the 70s, to the recent prominent celebrations of the art of Gustav Klimt, including the movie, The Woman in Gold, now playing everywhere, uh, and the music of Gustav Mahler. The importance of Vienna as a great art and cultural capital of the early 20th century is hardly in dispute. But what has been less well understood is the astonishing impact of what I shall call Austro-modernism, which it began to exercise in the post-World War I years, when artists and writers from the far-flung frontiers of the dismembered empire, writers mostly Jewish, who had received a classic German education, as authorized by the central K and K government, Kaiserlich und Königlich, which had a huge impact, came on the scene, as in those earlier maps. Joseph Roth, the author of the now classic Wardetsky March, 1933, was a native of Brodsky in Galicia. Let me go back a minute. So all the way over, see Galicia, the purple and yellow area near the Russian Empire. Um, he was a native of Brody in Galicia, incorporated into Poland, later into the Ukraine, who made his living as a journalist, first in Frankfurt and, and Berlin, then in Paris. Kennedy, Elias Kennedy, came from the Danube city of Rus, which is now Bulgaria, was a schoolboy in Manchester, England, grew up, studied, and launched his career in Vienna, only had to have to flee in 1938 to asylum in London. Um, Paul Salon, 1920 to 1970, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to let you on for a minute. Was, uh, was born Paul Anschel in Chernowitz, the capital of the Bukovina province, a territory incorporated into Romania in 1918, occupied by the Russians in 1944, and now part of the Ukraine. After World War II, he lived briefly in Bucharest, then in Vienna before marrying the French graphic artist Gisèle de la Somme and settling in Paris. Brody, Rus, Chernowitz. These multi-ethnic cities were hundreds of miles from Vienna, and their occupants inevitably spoke a number of languages, but the high culture of the Habsburg Empire provided the intellectual horizon. Current labels are thus rather misleading. Kafka is sometimes classified as a Czech writer, sometimes as German, sometimes as Jewish. He belonged, of course, to the empire. Selon is generally referred to as the Holocaust poet from <laughs> Romania, or again, uh, as in my colleague John Felstein is titled poet, and you Jew, so these odd titles, um, and very much of a, somebody from the empire. Kennedy is referred to as a Sephardi Jew raised in Bulgaria turned cosmopolite, or again, these writers are classified according to their written language as quite simply German. If you read a book like Russell Berman's The Rise of the German Novel, the Austrians are just footnotes. You wouldn't even know there was a difference. It's just sticking them somewhere in as something else. The Jewish link, moreover, has obscured the extent to which the decline and fall of the dual monarchy also transformed the lives of its non-Jewish writers. Gregor von Retzori, 1914 to 98, the later chronicler of the declining Habsburg Empire, whose cruel but brilliant confessions of an anti-Semite, that has just been re republished by the New York Review of Books, books in English last year, has recently, that's recently been issued, spent his childhood in the same town as Paul Salon, Chernowitz, and studied in Vienna. Robert Musil, whose Man Without Qualities, published in 1930, has long been considered the classic German dissection of the impending collapse of Kakania, as Musil called the Kaiserlich and Königlich Empire, was born in Corinthia. Austria received a classic Austrian education in Brno, which was called Brünn, in the Czech Republic, graduated from the Technical University, where his father was a leading professor, and continued his scientific studies in Berlin before settling with his Jewish wife, Martha, in Vienna. In 1938, the Musels had to flee Austria. They settled in Switzerland, where Musel died in great penury during the war. 
Now the list of these provincial Austrian writers goes on and on, culminating after World War II in the work of Thomas Bernhardt and Ingeborg Bachmann, both from the Austrian provinces, he from the Wallasee near Salzburg, she from Klagenfurt, about 25 miles from the Slovenian, then the Yugoslavian border. But as she has said in many places, the distance from my home in Corinthia to Vienna was much further than the distance from Vienna to Rome, or further than any distance I traveled such a different world. Now what can be called Austro-Modernist literature is thus characterized by its unique position vis-a-vis -vis the First World War. No other national culture experienced the trauma of sudden rupture as fully as did the Austrians. Germany, after all, had been a unified nation less than 50 years when World War I broke out, as had Italy. And however terrible the war was for the English and the French, their sense of national identity was not really called into question in 1918. That was to happen after World War II with the loss of the overseas empire. But consider that Sori's account. It's just a little typical account. That's where Sori's account of his native city. Chernowitz, and by the way, Chernowitz being in the Ukraine is not once again sort of being fought over. You know, we have constant things about what to do about the Ukraine. Chernowitz, where I was born, was the former capital of the former duchy of Bukovina, an easterly region of Carpathian forest land in the foothills of the Tatra Mountains. In 7075, ceded by the former Ottoman Empire to the former imperial and royal Austro-Hungarian realm as compensation for the latter's mediation, the Russian-Turkish War. After 1848, it became one of the autonomous former crown lands of the House of Habsburg. One can readily see that everything in this quick summary is designated as former, that is to say, not in the present, not truly existing. And this invests my birthplace with a kind of mythic aura, an irreal quality. It is no use to try to elucidate this mythic twilight by means of historical analysis. That the Austro-Hungarian monarchy has not existed since 1918 is well enough known, yet in Chernowitz, people acted as if they didn't really believe. German remains the everyday language of most people. Vienna, remained, Vienna was the closest metropolis, and no one thought of denying it the rank of capital. After 1940, the Book of Vienna was cut in two by state treaty between the Third Reich and the Soviet Union. The northern part, which included Chernowitz, now called Chernovitsky, if you look on Google, or it became part of the Soviet Republic of the Ukraine. As such, it was no longer the capital of the province because the capital of Ukraine is now Kiev. And notice how contested that is. I don't want to not argue for the Russians here at all, but I do understand how they feel about Kiev. Kiev is the city, the Russian city, the city of domes, the city of the churches, that Kiev has such, such a history for Dostoevsky, let's say, and so on, that it is always hard for me to believe it's no longer Russian part of the Ukraine contested territory. Now the literary ethos of Austrian post-war writers, all of them displaying a love-hate relationship to Vienna and opting for various forms of exile is curiously distinct, and that's what's often not understood from its German counterpart. In the research laboratory for world destruction, as Karl Kraus, born in the Czech town of Dzicin near the Polish border called Austria in his monumental anti-war play, The Last Days of Mankind, 1922, the trauma of war followed by the sudden and radical dissolution of the geographical entities into which these writers were born created a deeply skeptical and resolutely individualistic modernism, one much less ideologically charged than its counterpart in Germany. Neither the intellectually rigorous and revolutionary Marxism of Weimar, artists like Brecht, nor on the right Heidegger's post-transcendental philosophy centering on the disclosure of being in the world seems to have had much appeal to the ironic, satiric, darkly humorous, erotic, and often slightly mystical world of post-empire Austria. It's so much further east, and it's a Catholic country. I recently had the curator from the Neue Gallerie over just this week was traveling through, um, coming through LA. And we talked about this and he said, how can people ever confuse Austria and Germany? The difference between a Catholic country like Austria and a Protestant country like Germany is such a huge difference. And we talked about the erotic qualities and the exotic qualities and just the sheer physical location near Turkey has very different, um, a very different sense. Heidegger could not have been an Austrian writer and Sidney Wittgenstein could not have been a German writer. Just think about that for a minute. 
As Buzo put it in chapter four of The Man Without Qualities, in defining what he called his sense of possibilities, whoever has this sense and his possibilities does not say, for instance, here this or that has happened, will happen, must happen, but he invents here this or that might, could, or ought to happen. If he's told that something is the way it is, he will think, well, it could probably just as well be otherwise. The consequences of so creative a disposition can be remarkable and may regrettably often make what people admire seem wrong and what is taboo permissible, or also make both a matter of indifference. Such possibilists, Möglichkeits mention, are said to inhabit a more delicate medium, a hazy medium of mist, fantasy, daydreams, and the subjunctive mood. Children who show this tendency are dealt with firmly and warned that such persons are cranks, dreamers, weaklings, know-it-alls, or troublemakers. And that was his description of the Austrians of the time. And we could add imaginative writers and artists. Musel's analysis oddly echoes Wittgenstein's proposition, Tractatus, in the Tractatus, that everything we see could also, could also be otherwise, 5, 6, 3, 4. Or again, the sense of the world must lie outside the world. In the world, everything is as it is and happens as it does happen. In these circumstances, change came to mean for the Austrians, not political revolution, the change of the social political order, but a change of consciousness. One must try Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein repeatedly and stubbornly insisted to turn into a different person. And it's amazing how often that phrase comes up, to turn into a different person, not to change the regime. You can't do that, it's too hard, but to turn into a different person. Ironically, the refusal of direct political engagement did not preclude what was an extraordinary prescience about politics on behalf of Austro-modernist writers. Krauss and Kennedy are notable examples, but so is Joseph Roth, who understood early on how dangerous the idea of Anschluss would prove to be. Roth worked as a journalist, for the Frankfurt Zeitung, and but worked in Paris. He only adored Paris, hated Germany, and all these writers, by the way, including Salon, they had to go to Germany often because their publishers were in Germany, but the idea that because they were Austrian, they liked Germany, no, they loved France. But Germany, for all kinds of reasons, was not at all a country they were drawn to. In August 1925, Roth, then a Paris correspondent for the Frankfurt Zeitung, writes to his editor, I am desperate. I cannot, can't even go to Vienna, since the Jewish socialists have started clamoring for Anschluss. What are they after? They want Hindenburg? At the time that Emperor Franz Josef died, I was already a revolutionary, but I shed tears for him. I was a one-year volunteer in a Vienna regiment, a so-called elite unit, that stood by the Kapuzinerkopf as a guard of honor. And I tell you, I was crying. An epoch was buried. With the Anschluss, a culture will be put to the ground. Every European must be against the Anschluss. Do they want to become a sort of nether Bavaria? <laughs> now, Roth was often intemperate and irrational. He hated the Germans, veered between pro-Jewish sentiment and anti-Semitism, and was like his own hero of Solferino in the Radetzky March, in love with the emperor, with the Habsburg dynasty, and in certain moods with the Catholic Church. But he had an uncanny understanding of what was happening in Europe in the interwar years, and he also recognized that he himself was always and of necessity an outsider. The feeling of not belonging anywhere, which has always been with me, haunted him even in his beloved Paris. If being an outsider made it possible for him to write his brilliant dispatches about everyday life in post-war Berlin and Paris, there's just been a new one published, which is called Hotel Years, which was just reviewed in the New York Times book review this last Sunday, and I've reviewed it for book form, Hotel Years. They're just little feuilletons describing Berlin and the poverty, the terrible mood in Berlin in, say, 1923, 1924. Such contradictions and their endemic to Austrian modernism has been nicely pinpointed by Eric Hobsbawm, himself, of course, originally Austrian. Of all the great multilingual and multi-territorial empires that collapsed in the course of the 20th century, the decline and the fall of the Emperor Franz Josef's being both long expected and observed by sophisticated minds has left us by far the most powerful literary and narrative chronicle. Austrian minds had time to reflect on the death and disintegration of the empire, while it struck all the other empires suddenly, at least by the measure of the historical clock, even those invisibly declining health like the Soviet Union. But perhaps the perceived and accepted multilinguality, multiconfessionality, and multiculturality of the monarchy helped them to a more complex sense of historical perspective. 
Its subjects lived simultaneously in different social universes and different historical epochs. It's interesting that Hobsbawm, whose own childhood in 1920s Vienna was one of misery and hardship, and was soon to become a dedicated communist revolutionary, recognized that so far as literature was concerned, the most complex and powerful dissection of empire was that of the Austrians. Now, how do we characterize that distinctive ethos? And this, of course, is something I'll just begin. I mean, you can obviously do in all kinds of ways in, in depth. Austrian modernist literature is not avant-garde in the usual sense. It is not, for example, characterized by the collage and fragmentation of Dada and surrealism, by the stream of consciousness of Joyce and Wolf, of the introduction of visual elements into the verbal text, as in Pound's cantos, or Marion Moore's syllabic poems, or of the jazz rhythms in the poetry of Langston Hughes. On the surface, it's more conventional. Krauss's Last Days of Mankind is written in what seems to be transparent language with the simulating the dialect of workers' cafes or citing state documents. Roth's Rodetsky March looks like a traditional novel with an omniscient narrator and a beginning, middle, and end. In Musil's The Man Without Qualities, the essayistic mode seems to allow for authoritative ethical judgments only to undermine those judgments at every turn in the novel's Hall of Mirrors. Kennedy's The Tongue Set Free is an episodic memoir, seemingly casually structured and digressing. Even Salon's poetry, however minimalist it becomes in its late phase, is aligned on the page as traditional lyric, often quite closural, using consistent lineation and stanzaic structure. But although Austro-Modernist writing avoids the formal experimentation we associate with the avant-garde, its absorption of other language registers into the author's native German, its troubling anti-Semitism, its conviction most memorably expressed by Wittgenstein that argumentation called not for linear discourse, but a series of aphorisms, its transvaluation of normative values, its fondness for paradox and contradiction as modes of understanding, and especially the hard edge of its savage and grotesquely comic irony, these may well be, now that we're in the 21st century, more lasting legacies of modernism than the use of collage, the time shift, or the sound play of Hugo Ball's Gaji Berry Bimba. Then too, and this is especially the case with Musil and Krauss, Austro-modernism prefigures the use of documentation, appropriation, which I've discussed at much greater length with, in terms of contemporary poets, in our unoriginal genius. The most implausible conversations in this play, notes Krauss in the preface to Last Face of Mankind, were spoken verbatim. Its shrillest inventions are quotations. A document is a character. Reports rise up as living forms while the living dies editorials. That's a play where almost the whole play is based on actual materials, postcards sent from the front, political dispatches. So it really is one of the first appropriative works in a very interesting way. Um, where there's some things not, but mostly it is the direct, direct war writing. Construct a person from nothing but quotations. Musso writes in a 1920s notebook. From Freud and Wittgenstein through the 1930s, the documents of Austro-Modernism reflect a political rupture that could not be healed. Now consider what actually happened in October 1918, and obviously the, the literature is going to have to relate to this in some way. When the Treaty of Versailles simply dissolved the empire, and I'm using here a memoir my grandfather, who was in the ministry, wrote, because it seems so interesting to me, it seems so obvious in some ways. When they came back to their offices in the ministry in 1918, in the Wahlhausplatz in Vienna, in October 1918, right after the armistice was negotiated, he writes the following. I found my colleagues sitting silently in their offices, not knowing what to do, and avoiding a discussion of the catastrophe. I had worked with people of all nationalities for 20 years. Before the war, I had worked under two ministers of commerce, Focht and Fiedler, who were Czechs. And the undersecretary, Dr. Miller, was a Czech, and assistant secretary of Pol. In my, in my own department, two out of five officials were Czechs. They asked me if they should leave the office. What should they do? And I advised them to go to Prague, where they might be needed in the new government. They now belong to victorious Czechoslovakia and I to defeat in Austria. My own mother was a citizen of Czechoslovakia, where I had been born, in Brünn. The Secretary of State, Victor Adler, asked me to leave the Ministry of Commerce and come to the Foreign Office. <coughs> now, the resulting crisis had no parallel in Germany or in France. The newly established state of Czechoslovakia immediately cut off all coal supplies, 
I don't know if you know this part of the history, but that's when you had real starvation in Vienna because Czechoslovakia cut off the fuel, Hungary cut off the food, and Yugoslavia was the breadbasket, and there was no food being delivered. Um, so people went to the, and there was no firewood. It, the year after the war, it was a really terrible time. And England and France refused all loans and shipments of grain, flour, or oil. In the world of yesterday, Stefan Zweig gives a horrific account of his own train journey in 1918 from Feldkirch, the Swiss Austrian border station in the Vorarlberg, to Salzburg, where he owned property. And, that, and anyway, the guards, the guards who showed us our seats were haggard, starved, and ragamuffin. They crawled about with torn and shabby uniforms hanging loosely over their stooped shoulders. The leather straps for opening and closing windows had been cut off. For every piece of that material was precious. The electric bulbs had either been smashed or stolen, so that whoever searched for anything had to feel his way about with matches. Everyone held on to his baggage anxiously and hugged his package of provisions close. No one dared separate himself from the possession for a single minute in the darkness. A journey, coming to the end, a journey that usually took seven hours took 17. And on arrival in Salzburg, there were no porters, no cabs, no fuel, little food, and he writes, a young lad shot squirrels in our garden for a Sunday dinner, and well-nourished dogs and cats returned only seldom from lengthy prowls, because they were all killed and eaten. Now, against this background, and it's just really interesting just to read this tiny piece of history. Bear with me a minute. The first Austrian parliamentary elections were held in February 1919. There were in effect only two political parties, the Christian Socials and the Social Democrats. The Socialist Party primarily drew on Jewish Vienna. It won the first election by six seats, 69 to 63, with 26 votes for the small right-wing Nationalist Party. Victor Adler, the venerable socialist leader, had died shortly after the armistice. Karl Renner, a German-speaking Czech, who had been librarian for the Reichstag, became the first chancellor of the New Republic, and Otto Bauer, a leading Viennese Austro-Marxist, his foreign minister. In less than two years, the situation was reversed. In 1920, the Christian Socials won 79 seats to the Socialists 63. For the next 18 years, the Socialists never again won a national election, although they succeeded in creating a remarkable welfare state in Red Vienna itself. The latter became, as Lisa Silverman notes, a lone red city surrounded by the black Christian social provinces and federal government. Anti-Semitic rhetoric had linked socialism and Jews well before the interwar period, but linkage became even stronger as Jews became more involved and visible in the movement after World War I. In 1922, a Catholic priest, Ignat Seipel, was elected chancellor and the, the later chancellor, Adolphus, a controversial chancellor of the early 1930s, who ruled autocratically without parliament, also came from the priesthood. And it's right after that that Dolphus, the chancellor, was killed in that dramatic thing which Brecht based the rise of Arturo Ui, if you know that play, is based on the murder of Dolphus right in his own office. The Nazis just came in and murdered him. He was kind of fascist himself, but against the German Nazis, and called ultra-fascist, very much against the Nazis, and they just came into his office and killed him. Now, 10 of thousands of Jewish refugees fleeing the war in Galicia and Bukovina, as well as Poland and Western Russia, had been pouring into Vienna since the fall of 1914, fanning the flames of anti-Semitism that had long been latent in Catholic Austria. And I won't give you all the statistics because we don't really have time for that now, but it's incredible that after the emancipation of the Jews in the 60s, the 1860s, the Jews did too well. They want well, more than half the doctors, more than half the lawyers, the art historians, the psycho psychologists, you know that, about Freud, they owned the newspapers. That's why they were so hated, among other things. They owned most of the newspapers. The overrepresentation of the Jews in the social democratic movements of the period led the opening calls for ethnic cleansing. The Russian Revolution of 1905 had prompted a special wave of anti Semitism. Leon Trotsky, who lived in Vienna between 07 and 14, became the symbol of the Jewish drive toward communist revolution. And anyway, I won't go on with all that, but it was a, a really terrible period. And you have to understand certainly the literature in relation of that, especially at, after the war. Very different situation from before the war. And there's the seminal study, by, which I recommend to you, by Bernard Wasserstein, on his book On the Eve of the Jews Between the Wars, where you can see all that. Um, 
He assimilated, most of the writers, of course, were assimilated Jews, many of whom, like Wittgenstein and Victor Adler, came from families that had long been converted and had distanced themselves from their Jewish origin. They were now in an especially difficult position. Members of the preceding generation, for example, Schnitzler or Gustav Mahler, had certainly experienced anti-Semitism, but exile was not a necessity. On the contrary, these artists regarded Vienna as their home, their city. Austria-Hungary is no more, declared Freud in 1918. I do not want to live anywhere else. For me, emigration is out of the question. I shall live on with the torso and imagine that it is the whole. 20 years later, when the Nazis occupied Vienna, the 82-year-old Freud was still so reluctant to leave that he had to be dragged out of the house by his friends, and put on a train, and then he went to London. He really didn't want to leave. Now, in the following generation, such a qualified allegiance to our Vienna was replaced by much more complex and conflicted feelings. Post-war Vienna, Tins reminds us, was the scene of an anti-Semitic crusade, a campaign in Parliament to limit further immigration, very apropos today, was dominated by the allegations that Christian German civilization was under threat from an alliance of Marxists and Jews. Sounds familiar for today, right? For other things. The Bolshevik danger, as the future chancellor, Seipel declared in 1918, was a Jewish danger. Austrian Jews, ironically enough, thus found themselves longing for the lost world of empire. And you get all these passages where, oh, it was much better in the Habsburg days. Thus, exile became increasingly frequent. Whether the self-exile of Wittgenstein, who settled in Cambridge in 1930, or of Joseph Roth, who became a journalist in Paris, or the forced departure in 1938 of Kennedy and Musa. The much younger Paul Salon, who was studying literature in Chernowitz, officially part of Romania when World War II broke out, witnessed the Holocaust where his parents were killed and was a prisoner, first of the Nazis, then of the communists, before taking a permanent residence in France, where he also was not really at home, in 1948. Now what unites all these writers is their use of the German language, but specifically Austro-German, in which they were born. Children of the polyglot empire, they all spoke and often wrote more than one language. Kennedy's street language, for example, was Bulgarian, you know, all the languages, and it's more like Holland and, and Belgium in that way, that um, they knew all these languages, but certainly German remained the language of writing, and they never, and uh, so often as is spelled, folks lived in Paris, married to a French woman, you have to write in your native language. Salon's insistence on mother tongue is complicated because it came to being at the end of an empire characterized by multiplicity of languages. Susan Stanford Friedman talks of the multilingual archipelago of the Caribbean, but what is now fashionably called creolization was precisely the condition of the Habsburg Empire, where knowing more than one language was necessary for daily life, and members of the parliament gave their official speeches in their respective tongues. As the correct literary language, the German of the Austro-Modernisms thus became unusually self-conscious, the object of contemplation rather than a means of communication. Language, as Karl Krauss put it, is the only chimera whose deceptive power is infinite, the exhaustible resource in which life is not impoverished. Now, how does Krauss's own language relate to that of French and Anglo-American modernists to finish? What generalizations can we make about larger European as well as trans-European concerns? Globalist theory, with its commitment to translation, cannot gloss over the pan-English problem. To take the measure of modernism, the continent must be included. And there are signs that this is happening. At this writing, Vincent Sherry is preparing a large and ambitious edited volume called The Cambridge History of Modernism, which does include chapters on the major continental authors, movements, genres, and thematic motifs that made modernism what it was. I don't know yet whether it will be entirely successful, but anything like that can be entirely successful because it's so ambitious. And of course, again, the point of view comes from mostly from Anglo-Americans by necessity, sort of. So I'm not so sure, but I think at least it's a, a worthy attempt. Such a project cannot hope for perfect coverage, but it's certainly a start in the right direction. So to conclude, in redrawing the map of modernism, in any case, the two world wars must be seen as absolutely central. Now, I know many of you will not agree with that, but I never can understand how we talk about modernism and people talk about capitalism, and they talk about this as if the wars didn't occur. The wars determine that period. I don't see how one can 
ever, you know, from this point in history, not realize what role both those wars play. At our millennial moment, we might begin by taking what Stein and Picasso call with reference, reference to the new aerial view of the Northern European ground, which they call the Cubist War, from seen, as seen from the air, as a circle whose circumference is the Second World War on the same soil of France and Belgium, Germany and Russia, but also this time in North Africa, in India, and across the Pacific. Postmodernism in this scheme of things can only refer quite literally to the post-World War War phase of global development, and that phase can be understood only in relation to the modernism that is hoped, perhaps not always successfully, to surpass. <laughs>